Hello, everybody, and welcome back to BioSC 140 Human Physiology. This is the part three video for membrane dynamics. So, jumping right into it. Protein transporters facilitate the diffusion of large lipophilic molecules. So, large molecules that cannot readily move across the cell membrane, they need a little extra help. And in some situations, channels are a great method to do that. But for other types of molecules, channels just don't work well, mother, for any number of reasons. Protein transporters can come in and help these molecules get across the cell membrane. So facilitated diffusion, net movement of like particles using a protein transporter from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So high concentration to low concentration, just knowing that it works in that direction and based on what you know from the previous videos, you should know that it's passive. It does not require additional energy. All the energy required for this to happen is in the concentration gradient that's already set up. There's no ATP required, high concentration to low concentration. These transporters will bind a specific substrate or ligand. Ligand is something that binds onto a, a receptor or a protein transporter and changes the conformation to transport them across the cell membrane. So there's a bunch of vocab in this sentence right here. So a substrate or a ligand, that's the thing that's gonna to bind to the receptor, or bind to the protein transporter. Changes conformation. So some of you might understand this word conformation. Conformation refers to the shape of a molecule. In this case, the shape of the protein transporter. So when the substrate binds onto it, it changes the shape of that protein which transports them through the membrane. So right here you can see red circle is the molecule to be transported. Red circle binds onto the protein transporter and when it does so it changes the shape. It changes the conformation of the protein transporter and transports it in. And then once the red circle unbinds, the conformation will change back to its original conformation, its original shape, so that it can transport another molecule. Um, this is a organic chemistry, biochemistry term um, that some of you might know and some of you might not. They're not as fast as channels. They're not as fast as channels. I mean, channels are a direct route, direct tunnel, and things can just flow right through. These things, you have to have this shape change. You have to have binding, changing of shape, releasing of ligand, changing back of shape before another molecule can do it. That be transported, so it's slower. There's never a continuous passage between the inside and outside of the cell. With uh, channels, when their gates are open, it's, it's a tunnel. It's a straight shot right through. With these, there's never a continuous passage from outside to inside. There are some characteristics and some terms that I want you to know relating to these protein transporters. And you're gonna see these terms throughout the rest of the semester. So please take note, they're underlined, they're bold, they're vocab words. So specificity. Specificity is the selectivity of a binding site or ligand, a binding site to ligand interaction. So right here is a, glu tra a glucose transporter. It's gonna transport glucose and maybe a few other very, very similar molecules, molecules that are almost identical in shape and chemistry. So glucose binds, it gets transported through. Over here, we have a maltose bind. You can see that maltose does not cause a conformation change in the protein transporter. So even if it can bind to the, the protein transporter, it still doesn't 
match it perfectly enough to be transported into the molecule or into the, the cell. So there is specificity when it comes to these protein transporters. A ligand is a molecule that binds a receptor. In this case, that receptor is this protein transporter. It's based on, so specificity is based on the 3D structure and also the chemistry. You know, it needs to have the right polarity at the right spot on the molecule, the right charge at the right spot on the molecule. Competition. So competition, related substances compete for transport binding. So glucose can bind this receptor site, this protein, and get transported in. Maltose can bind it. It doesn't get transported in, but when maltose is interacting with this protein, glucose cannot. Glucose and maltose are competing for this binding site on this transport protein. Now, even though maltose doesn't get transported in, it's still competing with glucose for that spot because there is some interaction here. There's competition. When maltose is interacting, glucose cannot interact. When glucose is interacting, maltose cannot interact. It depends on concentration and affinity. Competitive inhibition. So competitive inhibition. So this would be an example of competitive inhibition. When maltose is binding, it's inhibiting glucose. When maltose is competing, when maltose is binding and interacting with this protein, Glucose cannot. It's competitively inhibiting the transport of glucose across this membrane. It's competitively inhibiting the normal function, the glucose transporting function of this protein. Uh, it depends on concentration, so how many glucoses are there, how many maltoses are there in the area, and affinity. Affinity is how tightly it binds. So imagine that maltose has a weak affinity. That would be a, a weak attraction between maltose and the protein. Maltose binds, and an instant later it comes off. That would be a weak affinity. Now imagine a situation where maltose binds, and it doesn't pop off, doesn't come off for three hours. It just stays on. That would be a strong affinity. So saturation. Uh, the rate of transport has a maximum. Transport increases with increasing substrate concentration until transporters are full. So the transport max depends on both substrate and transporter concentration. So let's say I'm going to make an analogy. Let's say students working on homework questions. Let's say a student can do, actually that's a bad analogy. Let's cancel that analogy. So saturation. Let's look at this situation right here. Glucose binds and then it gets transported across the membrane. It's going to take a certain amount of time for that glucose to be transported about the membrane and then to have this protein change its shape back to its original shape so that it can move another protein. It takes time. While it's transporting this glucose, no other glucose can bind on and be transported. So when this glucose, when this protein transporter is transporting and cannot bind another glucose, it's considered to be saturated. Saturated. Now let's think of a situation where there's a thousand of these on a cell membrane. If 100 of them are working at a certain time, more glucoses could still bind to the other 900 glucose transporters. It's not saturated. They're still ready available protein transporters. Now let's say there's an increase in glucose concentration and 700 of the thousand glucose transporters are transporting glucose at one given time, but the other 300 are not. Well, the amount of glucose being transported at a given time has now increased to you know, the rate that 700 transporters can, but there's still a possibility of increasing the rate even further. Now let's increase the amount of glucose in the area, and now at any given time, 
all 1,000 glucose transporters are transporting glucose into the cell. You cannot increase the rate because you only have 1,000 glucose transporters. If all 1,000 glucose transporters are working at the maximum speed they possibly can, you can't increase the rate. You cannot increase the rate of transport anymore because all 1,000 of them are working over time. So saturation, so that would mean that they're saturated. Let's look at this chart down here. So on the y-axis, we have rate of transport. On the x-axis, we have extracellular substrate concentration. So the amount of concentration of glucose on the outside. As we increase the amount of glucose outside of our hypothetical cell, we increase the odds of a glucose molecule hitting the transporter, binding with that transporter and moving into the cell. So we increase the rate as we increase the concentration of glucose. At this point right here, we're gonna reach that hypothetical situation where every glucose transporter is working at maximum speed. The moment one glucose transporter is done transporting glucose into the cell, it goes back to its original conformation and instantly there's a glucose there to bind onto it and be transported again. All your transporters are working full speed. If you increase the concentration further, you do not increase the rate of transportation. So cells avoid reaching equilibrium by metabolizing substrates and changing their identity. So we have high glucose concentration outside, low glucose concentration on inside. The glucose transporter transports glucose in, transports glucose in, and eventually you're gonna equal equilibrium where there's the same amount of glucose on the outside as there is on the inside and there's, you've reached equilibrium. In reality, we don't reach that because as glucose moves in, glucose is gonna be turned into other molecules, other things, because we're gonna use that glucose to make energy. So glucose concentration on the inside of the cell is always decreasing. And so there's always high concentration of glucose outside, always low concentration of glucose inside. Glucose molecule goes in, it gets broken down for energy, boom, less con lower concentration inside the cell. Glucose molecule moves in, gets broken down for energy, boom, lower concentration inside the cell. Osmosis. So osmosis is probably <laughs> it's probably the toughest uh, of these uh, transport mechanisms for students to get, but don't worry, we're going to get it. Um, there's going to be a lab, lab 7-8, where we, we go over osmosis also, and we're really going to see osmosis in action. So osmosis refers, to, refers specifically to the movement of water across a membrane. So water. Can you do osmosis with glucose? No. Can you do osmosis with sodium? No. Can you do osmosis with water? Yes, it's water only. It's the net movement of water. Water, that's a key word, water, across a semi-permeable membrane from area of low concentration to high solute concentration. So, let's look at this example. We've got this tube here, equal amount of water on both sides, high concentration of glucose on B side, low concentration of glucose on A side. This membrane in the middle, glucose cannot pass through, but water can move through. So how is water gonna move across this membrane? Well, water is gonna move to dilute. Remember this phrase, the solution to pollution is dilution. The solution to pollution is dilution. So this, these dissolved glucose, that's pollution. Water is gonna to move towards the pollution to dilute it. So what's gonna happen? Water is gonna move across this membrane into the B side until the concentration of glucose is equal on both sides of the membrane. 
water is going to move towards the number of dissolved particles. Now, does it care if it's glucose? Could this also be fructose? Yeah. It, when it comes to osmosis, it doesn't matter what the dissolved thing is. It just matters that there are dissolved things. So it depends on the number of dissolved particles, not on the identity, as long as they can't move through the membrane. So it depends on the number of dissolved particles, not on the identity. So it could be fructose, it could be glucose, it doesn't matter. Water is gonna to move to dilute until there's an equal number of dissolved particles on both sides of the membrane. Rewatch that part if you need to. So, osmolarity. Osmolarity is the amount of dissolved particles. It's a unit, a measure of the dissolved particles within a solution. So, how do you figure out osmolarity? It's molarity times the number of dissolved particles per molecule. All right, so we're going to look at some examples in a moment of this. We'll come back to that osmolarity idea. So, tonicity considers properties of a solute and the membrane, and the membrane. So, osmolarity is the amount of dissolved particles within that solution. Tonicity talks about what's going to happen to a cell when put into different osmotic situations. So this will make sense. We're going to get through this. So tonicity describes how a solution affects the cell. Tonicity describes how the solution it will affect the cell. So two categories. Um, tonicity depends on the concentration of non-penetrating solutes. Penetrating can cross the cell membrane. Non-penetrating cannot cross the cell membrane. So let's talk about what can cross the cell membrane and what cannot cross the cell membrane. We're going to do some math problems regarding this. And in our problems, the only molecule that we're going to use that can cross the cell membrane is urea. Now remember, from part one of this lecture, the smaller a molecule is, the more likely it is to move across the cell membrane. The more lipophilic a molecule is, the more likely it is to move across a cell membrane. Non-penetrating. The larger a molecule is, the more polar a molecule is, the less likely it is to move across a cell membrane. So urea is going to be the only molecule that we talk about in these problems that can move across a cell membrane. Non-penetrating ones are going to be different um, ions and glucose. So let's talk about hypotonic. So in a hypotonic situation, a cell swells when placed in that solution. The cell has higher concentration of non-penetrating solutes. So right here is a hypotonic cell. This is what a, a red blood cell looks like in a hypotonic solution. So let's look at what we're, what's going on here. We have a solution and we put red blood cells into that solution there is a higher concentration of non-penetrating solutes within the red blood cell. So remember, the solution to pollution is dilution. Water is gonna move towards the higher concentration of dissolved particles. So there's higher concentration of dissolved particles in the red blood cell. Water is gonna move into the red blood cell and make it swell up like a balloon. Let's look at hypertonic. With hypertonic, the cell shrinks when placed in the solution because the cell has a lower concentration of solutes. Right here is a hypertonic red blood cell. You put this red blood cell in this hypertonic solution and there's more dissolved particles in the solution than in the red blood cell. So water is gonna leave the red blood cell. Water is gonna to move towards the pollution, towards the dissolved particles, and it's gonna reduce the volume of water within the red blood cell. 
it's going to, it's called crenate, the vocab word for the shriveling of a red blood cell because of a hypertonic solution is called, it's, it's crenated. Crenated, that's a vocab word, it'll come up later. Isotonic, isotonic is when the concentration of solutes is the same on the inside and outside of the red blood cell, so we get the proper shape. Now, your blood, which one of these three do you think your blood counts as with regards to a red blood cell? Well, I'd say it's a pretty good idea to have isotonic uh, blood. You want your red blood cells to be this shape, so your blood needs to be an isotonic solution to your red blood cell. You need to have the same number of dissolved particles in your blood as you do within your red blood cells. Otherwise, you know, you get prenated or giant red blood cells. You need to have that proper biconcave shape. All right, so we're gonna walk through some problems with regards to osmicity and tonicity, and I think it's gonna shed some light on exactly what's going on here. So osmicity and tonicity are related, but distinct properties of a solution. So osmicity compares the initial Osmicity compares the initial conditions of the cell in solution. It compares osmolarities but ignores particle identity. Osmicity, you're just looking at osmolarity. Is there more os is there more dissolved particles in the solution or more dissolved particles within the cell? It's not what's going to happen to the cell. It's where are there more dissolved particles? Are there dissolved particles in the solution? or there are more dissolved particles in the cell, not what happens to the cell. Tonicity talks about what happens to the cell. What's the outcome? So osmicity, what's the initial particle concentrations? Tonicity, what happens to the cell? Does it, is it a hypotonic where it swells like this? Is it a hypertonic where it shrinks like this? or is it unchanged isotonic? All right, so it's outside relative to inside. Outside relative to inside. If the outside of the cell, the solution, has a higher concentration of dissolved particles, it's hyperosmotic. Outside is greater than inside, hyperosmotic. If the outside has fewer dissolved particles than the inside of the cell, it's hypoosmotic, outside relative to inside. If the outside and the inside are the same, it's isoosmotic. Ignores particle identity and permeability. So it doesn't matter if we're talking about urea or you know, sodium, it's all the same. Ignores particle identity. Tonicity, tonicity is what happens to a cell when you put it into a solution. So hypotonic, it's gonna swell. Hypertonic, it's gonna shrink. Isotonic, it's unchanged. And it considers particle permeability. So we're gonna look exactly what I mean with considers particle permeability next. Um, if it's urea or if it's glucose, it can play a difference. So before we jump into our first example, we need to look at some characteristics of dissolved particles. So, when doing these osmicity tonicity problems, I'm only ever gonna ask you about these molecules right here. I'm never gonna ask you about any other molecules other than these five right here. When calculating osmolarity, which is the first step, you do it by multiplying molarity by the number of dissociable particles. What do I mean by dissociable particles? Dissociable particles are the number of particles that a molecule will break into when put into water. So salt, sodium chloride, it's an ionic, salute, ionic compound. When you drop sodium chloride into water, it dissociates into a positive sodium ion and a negative chloride ion. So there's two particles. There's two dissociable particles in a sodium chloride molecule. 
With potassium chloride, it breaks apart. It's an ionic compound. It breaks apart into two dissociable particles, positive potassium and negative chloride, two dissociable particles. With calcium chloride, we have two chlorides and one calcium. So we have three dissociable particles. Glucose does not split. It stays one molecule when you put it in water. And urea, same thing. It stays one molecule when you put it in water. These top three, after they break apart and dissociate, they become positive ions or charged ions. They cannot move across the cell membrane. Glucose is large and polar. It does not move across the cell membrane. Urea is small and lipid soluble. It can move across the membrane. So for these problems, urea is the only molecule that can move across the cell membrane. I'll repeat that because it's really important for these problems. Urea is going to be the only penetrating, the only molecule that can move across the cell membrane. Now before I move on, I want to do some examples of calculating osmolarity. So let's say we have one molar glucose. What is the osmolarity of one molar glucose? Well, molarity, one molar times number of dissociable particles times one dissociable particles. So we have one times one. The osmolarity is one osmoles. Now let's say we have one molarity of sodium chloride. So one molar sodium chloride times how many dissociable particles? Two dissociable particles. So one times two, we have two osmoles as our osmolarity of a one molar sodium chloride solution. What is the osmolarity of a one molar of a, of a, of a What's the osmolarity of a two molar calcium chloride solution? Two molar calcium chloride solution. Well, it's two molar, so let's put a two here. Times number of dissociable particles. We got three dissociable particles, so two times three would be six osmoles. Now, when we do these problems, we're always going to be talking about millimolarity and milliosmoles. It's done the same way. It's just, you know, the units are a little different. It's millimolar instead of molar and milliosmoles instead of osmoles. So these are the five steps, and you're not going to remember anything if I just read these right here. But I'd print this out and kind of have it as like a guide that you can practice through. Let's just jump right in. So step one of doing these osmolarity and tonicity problems. You need to make sure that we're in the units of milliosmoles. You need to make sure that we're in the units of milliosmoles. So sometimes when I do these problems, I will say you have a 100 milliosmole solution of sodium chloride. If I say you have a 100 milliosmole solution, um, solution of, um, 100 milliosmole solution of sodium chloride, you're already in milliosmoles. So pay attention to units. You can skip the first step. If I say you have a 100 millimolar solution of sodium chloride, you need to turn millimolar into milliosmoles. So how do we do that? So convert to milliosmoles is the first step. So if we have 70 millimolars of calcium chloride, well, let's go back to our equation right here for osmolarity. 70 millimolar times three dissociable particles for calcium chloride. We get uh, 70 times three. This, what's going on here? All right. Well, okay, so these numbers are off right here. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, this is, this is not equal right here. So this should be 100 milliosmoles right here, 100 milliosmoles. So it matches the answer and over here. So well, 70 times 3 would be uh, 210. But down here, it says 300. Over here, it's 100. So let's just turn this to a 100. So 100 milliosmoles of calcium chloride. 
times three dissociable particles, we're gonna get 300 milliosmoles. 100 millimolar calcium chloride times three dissociable particles, we get 300 milliosmoles. For every one of these problems, the milliosmoles of the cell is gonna be 280. For every one of these problems, the milliosmoles of the cell is gonna be 280. So you can always assume it's 280 milliosmoles for the cell. And we're only gonna use red blood cells. So determine the osmicity. So now that we've calculated 300 milliosmoles for the solution, and two, we have 280 for the cell, compare outside to inside. So outside is 300, inside is 280. It's hyperosmotic, hyperosmotic. Are there any urea molecules? No. So all of these dissociable particles are gonna stay outside the red blood cell. What direction is water gonna move? We have 300 milliosmoles in the solution. We have 280 milliosmoles in the red blood cell. What direction is water gonna move? Water's gonna to move towards the higher concentration of dissolved particles, the higher osmolarity. So water's gonna move from, the in, from inside the cell, the 280 inside the cell, towards the 300 on the, in the solution. So water's gonna move from the cell into the solution. It's gonna be hypertonic, hypertonic. The cell is gonna shrink, it's going to cremate. So right here, let's look at another example. So we have 100 millimolar urea, 100 millimolar urea solution. So let's calculate uh, osmoles from millimolars. So 100 millimolar urea times one dissociable particle. We have a 100 millimolar urea solution. We just assume we know that milliosmoles of red blood cells is 280. So we have a lower osmolarity within the solution in the cell. So outside relative to inside, it's hypoosmotic. We are now going to move any permeable substances. So this is where it gets different for urea compared to glucose and the ions that we're talking about. Urea can move through the red cell membrane and it's going to. Urea is gonna move down its concentration gradient until there's equal number of particles inside the cell as there are outside the cell. An equal concentration inside the cell as there is outside the cell. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna split that 100 millimolar urea. We're gonna put 50 of it into the cell. 50 of it in the cell. Half of the urea is going to go down its concentration gradient into the red blood cell. So 100 millimolar, we're gonna have 50 move into the cell. So we have milliosmoles of the solution is equal to 100 minus 50. So we end up with a 50 milliosmoles for the solution. Milliosmoles for the cell, we, have, we started out with 280. We're gonna add 50 to it. We get 330. So when calculating tonicity, we're gonna move permeable substances. We're gonna split the permeable substances between the cell and the solution. So we started out with 100 milliosmoles of urea. We're gonna move 50 of it into the cell, creating a 330 milliosmoles situation within the cell and reducing the solution to 50 milliosmoles. Now we're gonna see what direction water is gonna move at this point. So the solution has 50, the cell has 330. What direction is water gonna move? Water's gonna move towards the cell. Water's gonna move towards the cell. It's gonna be hypotonic. We're gonna have a swollen cell. The cell's gonna swell up with water. Now let's look at a situation where we have 70 millimolar calcium chloride in 140 millimolar urea. All right, so we've got 70 millimolar calcium chloride and 140 millimolar urea in the same solution. So let's break this down. 140 millimolar urea, need to turn that into osmoles. So times one associated with particle, we've got 140 milliosmoles. 
70 millimolar KCl. I'm going to times that by two um, dissociable particles. We're going to get 70 times two, 140. We're going to add those together because they're in the same solution. We're going to add these together because they're in the same solution. So 140 plus 140, we have 280 milliosmoles within the solution. We assume 280 every time for the milliosmolarity of the red blood cell. Determine osmicity. 280 is equal to 280. The milliosmoles of the solution is equal to the milliosmoles of the red blood cell. We've got isoosmotic. Isoosmotic. We're now going to move any permeable substances. So does KCL move across the cell membrane? It doesn't. So KCL remains on the outside. Urea moves through the cell membrane. So we need to split that 70 molar, that, those 140 milliosmoles from urea in the solution and in the red blood cell. So 140 milliosmoles, sorry, 140 milliosmoles of urea. We're going to put 70 of that into the red blood cell. So we'll have 280, our starting point for the red blood cell. Add 70 to it, we get 350 milliosmoles for the red blood cell. 280, the starting point for the solution, minus 70 milliosmoles of urea. We get 210 milliosmoles for the red blood cell when calculating tonicity. So what direction is water going to move? We've got 210 in the solution, 350 in the cell. Well, water is going to move from the solution towards the cell. Water is going to move towards the cell. The solution to pollution is dilution. It moves into the cell. It's going to be hypotonic. The cell is going to swell up with water. So osmicity does not always equal tonicity. Osmicity does not always equal tonicity because urea can move across the cell membrane and change the situation. Osmicity and tonicity are not always the same. Tonicity. Tonicity is how the cell changes. So there's a lot of, um, if you look on the website, there's actually a lot of practice, mo um, practice questions for this. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, but I think there's like nine or 12 different practice problems. There's a bunch of different practice problems. All right, here's what it looks like underneath the microscope. So isotonic, we have our perfect biconcave, normal looking in the red blood cells. Hypotonic, so we have some swollen red blood cells, but some of them swell so much that they just burst and you just get cell fragments. With hypertonic, water leaves the cells and you get crenated cells. They look, uh, they almost look like Lisa Simpson, kind of like the spiky hair from the Simpsons, you know that? Um, so yeah, they, they shrink and shrivel, they crenate. All right, I'm gonna pause part three right here and I will see you in the next video.